So it is really a great pleasure for the New Zealand section of the Theosophical Society to introduce Professor Robert Temple. And Robert will be speaking of uh, a new science of heaven based on his book that has been released. When was it released, Robert? Was it in March? Um, yes, I think it was March 24th. So without any further um, delay, I'll, it's um, welcome to our platform, Robert. Thank you. So it's a great privilege for me to be addressing um, a group of uh, theosophists because the Theosophical Society uh, was created by Madame Blavatsky and her friend Colonel Alcott in order to combat um, the decadence and materialism of our uh, uh, civilization of today. Um, I'm very glad that you're interested in this new book of mine called A New Science of Heaven, because it was a lot of work and it's intended for the general public. And it is not easy to take really complicated scientific stuff and um, write about it in a way that might irritate the scientists because there are, there's not a single equation in that book. And that makes a lot of scientists very nervous to have any book without equations. But um, I'm trying to get through to, to intelligent, ordinary people who are not working scientists, because the message of the book is so important that um, really, if we can get our heads around all this new information, and there's new information on almost every page, um, that's why most of my friends are reading it a second time, um, that uh, it will affect our attitude towards just about everything. Now, a lot of what's in that book is very much in line with the kind of thing that theosophists have been talking about for uh, over 100 years. But um, we now have the scientific basis for a lot of those speculative um, uh, thoughts, you see. Science has moved on, but because science is so fragmented, the different scientists don't know what each other are doing. You can be in some university in a lab, and you have absolutely no idea what people 30 feet down the hall in the next lab are doing. You don't even know who they are necessarily. And even if you were to try to speak to them, they, they would be talking in their lingo. It's really like the Tower of um, Babel has, uh, ha has disintegrated again in academia because they don't have any way of really communicating with each other as science has become so splintered up into excessive specializations. And there are no generalists attempting to build the bridges between all those specializations. And, and they really don't uh, even have the same equation language because they change the, the meanings of the standard symbols for their group. So if you try to look at their equations, you say, well, wait a minute, that, that symbol, that's supposed to mean something. But in fact, for them, it changed the meaning. And, and they have their jargon. And if you don't know that jargon, I mean, you need a dictionary to read their paper, each paper. And um, so we're in a bit of a mess there. So I've attempted to build some bridges and, and do a general uh, survey of the amazing discoveries of plasma research in the past 10, 15 years. <clears throat> some of it <clears throat> just in the past five years or less. And, um, what has been discovered by all these different people who don't necessarily speak to each other, so they don't know, is if put together, a fantastic new view of the universe. And that's why I've called my book, A New Science of Heaven, because it is a new science. And I'll tell you why. The fundamental thing to know is about plasma. But before I start talking about plasma, I have to say that there are two meanings of the word plasma. For a long time, plasma has been familiar to people as a word used in hospitals for something to do with blood. That's the medical use of the word plasma. We have nothing to do with that. The word plasma was introduced into physics in 1928. In 1879, Sir William Crookes, who, who in fact, I think used to go to theosophical lectures. He was also a member of the Society of Psychical Research. He invented the vacuum tube. And he was a very brilliant scientist, but of course, he alienated a lot of scientists by thinking of higher things, and that's forbidden, isn't it, in a materialistic world. So, but he discovered something which he called radiant matter, and, and he found it in his vacuum tubes that he'd invented. 
Well, that radiant matter was plasma. And in 1928, a chap called Irving Langmuir um, was um, experimenting with all this. And he, just, he invented the new word, which is basically Greek, um, of plasma. And, that, and that's the plasma we're talking about. Now, what is plasma? Plasma is a form of matter that does not contain atoms. Now, you may have to just stop a moment and, and get your head around that. Matter that does not contain atoms? Hold on a minute. Am I serious? Yes, I am. It's, um, it's now known by all astronomers and astrophysicists that the universe consists of 99.9% .9 plasma, not atoms. This is not what they teach you at school. The sun is made of plasma, completely made of plasma. The stars are all completely made of plasma. We have plasma here on earth. Lightning is plasma. The center of a candle flame is plasma. The neon lights in, in your office where you work contain plasma. That plasma ceases to exist when you turn the switch off because these are tubes filled with a gas like neon and uh, if electricity goes into it, in the center of that tube, uh, you've got a stream of plasma, which is what gives you all the light. And it's so hot that it's 12,000 degrees Celsius or centigrade. And that's pretty hot. That is in fact, um, more than twice the temperature of the surface of the sun. And it's inside the neon light tube in your office. And if you touch that neon light tube, it's not hot. Why is that? And you can touch it and you won't get your fingers burned, even though in the center of that tube, it's 12,000 degrees. Well, now, there's clearly a lot going on here that people have not been told. So you have to start finding out for yourselves about all this. And I've written my book as a kind of guidebook or um, like a, a reference book uh, to try to explain the basics to people who are not being informed about all this. You can't read about these things in the, in the so-called scientific columns of, of the press and, and the science columnists and, and, and the science writers. And I used to be one of those and, and I have seen a, a decline in, in the standards of science writing for the popular media to the point where it's kind of idiotic and inane. Um, and, and now the people doing it are all 20-somethings who, who don't really know science anyway, a lot of them. And um, they're not telling you the important things. You know, they go all about climate change and they'll talk about um, droughts, which are pretty important. Um, and we could talk for days about all those problems, but we're not going to. Because what we're focusing on is this absolutely crucial business of what the universe is really made of. Now, we are stuck with our present science on earth in what I call a pre-Copernican age. <clears throat> Copernicus, as you know, <clears throat> was the man who told everybody, to everyone's shock and horror, that <clears throat> the sun wasn't going around the earth. <clears throat> if you ask anybody in the days of Copernicus about the sun going around the earth, they'd say, well, of course it does. I mean, you can see it doing it. You know, it comes up in the morning, there it is. And, and then it, in, in, in the middle of the day, it's, it's up there and then it moves over and goes down. You can see it going down. Well, of course the sun's going around the earth. I mean, you have to be an idiot not to know that. That's what's called conventional knowledge, which is always wrong, always. What everybody thinks is always wrong. You have to start out as the, the strictest skeptic that ever lived in order to get anywhere. So I don't believe anything that anybody tells me. It's all wrong. Every theory is wrong. Everybody is wrong because we can never really fully comprehend the truth. And there's no use getting stuck on a theory. Like most of the scientists, you know, they got their theories. So you can imagine what Copernicus went through. Well, uh, Galileo, who believed Copernicus, he was going to be killed but he recanted in order to save his life uh, because the, the, the church was going to kill him because he said 
that the earth was going around the sun, and this is against God, isn't it? I mean, it's against God and, and Jesus, and the Virgin Mary won't like that. And um, as for St. Joseph, I mean, what a scandal. So you see, you can't do this kind of thing without upsetting the whole world. So you have to be willing to upset the whole world. And that's the only way we're going to get anywhere. So we are still in that pre-Copernican age because our physics is entirely based on atoms. But the universe is not. The universe is not based on atoms. The universe does not consist of atoms. Atoms compose less than 0.1% of what's in the universe. Now we're living on this uh, hard, rocky planet, well, covered in ocean, uh, called Earth. And it's all made of atoms. And uh, you know, you can uh, touch the chair that you're sitting on and it's there, isn't it? It seems pretty solid. Um, doesn't matter that it's 99% empty, that, that we'll ignore that it's a slightly embarrassing fact. And the fact is that we think that everything's solid and real and made of atoms and, and what we call physical matter, technically speaking, should be called atomic matter because it's made of atoms. And we've all been taught at school that there are these atoms. And we do know that atoms consist of atomic particles. Everybody accepts that now, although it was a struggle to get there. And um, those are called electrons and protons and things. And um, OK, so they've got particles. But still, they're, they're there, aren't they? I mean, the atoms and everything's atomic. and um, you know, I'm solid, I can beat my chest, and um, uh, I can thump my desk, and I could touch this screen, but I wouldn't want to do that just at the moment. And, and it all seems very solid and real, but that's not true. And um, our physics is based on atoms. Now, what are atoms? Okay, so we've got a balance of positive charge and negative charge to make an atom. In the center of the atom, I'm taking the simplistic model, we have um, positive charge, we have um, protons, we even have uh, neutral uh, versions of them called neutrons. And, um, and then going around in a kind of cloud are what maybe waves or maybe particles, we're not quite sure, but we call them electrons, we pretend they're particles, and maybe they are, because they do strike things. So that's kind of particle-like, isn't it? But they're also wave-like. So what, we'll, we don't have to worry about that side of things. The main thing is that an atom is where the positive and negative charges are in balance. And so that then you can get a complete atom. Now, an atom that is incomplete is called an ion. That's I-O-N. And what's going on there is it's not got the right number of electrons. And it's, so the, the, there's done, you can have positively charged ions, but... I mean, you can have negatively charged ions, but we're mostly concerned with the positively charged ones, which have had, don't have complete electrons. Now, <clears throat> what, what's kind of necessary here is a reversal of thinking. I don't look upon ions as standard physicists do as incomplete atoms. That's how they think of them. I turn the whole thing on its head. And I look upon atoms as kind of freakishly completed ions, which are not normal or natural because atoms shouldn't be complete in most cases. They need to be charged and uh, not to have a balance of charge. In other words, if you're gonna have an ion, uh, keep some of those electrons out. And, and so the electrons and the ions and the positively charged particles known as protons fill the universe and that they compose what's called plasma so the universe is really composed of particles not atoms well now considering that our physics is all based on atoms where does that leave us because we're only uh, having a physics that deals with less than 0.1 percent of what exists okay that's fine it's it's good to have that um uh, minority version of physics, the pre-Copernican version of physics, which deals with our world in which we're temporarily living. Because um, as you can guess, I, I'm a firm believer in reincarnation and we'll come to that. But, um, and we've, we've come down into, uh, I use the metaphor of coming down into 
of physical matter to live lives in this physical world, which is with a good reason. And, you know, we shouldn't despise it like some of the ascetics do. Um, th there are reasons why we do this because it's a great learning curve and, and, uh, and we test ourselves here and we often fail. In fact, we fail more than we succeed in everything. But that's what happens here. So, but the universe is a plasma universe. And that's why we need, uh, we have to have this new science of heaven. Because if you've got a plasma universe and you have a physics that's not a plasma physics, well, you're in trouble. And so there, we do have plasma physics now going on, but it's a minority science. It's got different um, sections and divisions. And um, most plasma research going on is, is for what we call hot plasmas. And there are reasons for that because it's connected with uh, attempts to get uh, fusion energy and uh, atomic bomb triggers and all kinds of things like that, which have practical uses. We think we can control it, although maybe we can't, who knows. But cold plasmas are the really important ones and they are the ones that exist in space. Now, just in case you think they're only in space, don't, because um, plasma exists in every molecule in your body. You've got plasma inside you. And it was Léon Brion, the, uh, the French physicist who first proposed this, and the great proponent of this idea was a man I, I met called Albert St. Georgi. Um, he was a Hungarian refugee in America. Um, he wrote several books about explaining why there's plasma in the body. And uh, the human body operates really on the basis of, of electrical charges. And um, our bodies contain semiconductors. You have to have semiconductors if there's electricity going on to control the flow. The reason why a semiconductor is needed in an electric circuit is that if, uh, if you've got too much coming, you have to slow that down and diminish it or it blows out the, the things that are gonna work from it. On the other hand, you might have too little and you might need to amplify the current to make it uh, work. I won't go into all that electrical engineering stuff, but it's, some of it's in the book. Um, and it's connected with the electric universe theory that many of you will have heard of. Because there's a chap in Australia, uh, who, whom I know, who is one of the main proponents of that. So, and I do believe in the electric universe theory, absolutely. Before you even ask that question, the answer is yes. So, but that's only part of the story. I do not believe that the sun is powered by a giant hydrogen bomb going off in its center. And I think that's complete nonsense. And I have a chapter in the book called The Cold Sun. Um, let me just digress for a moment to talk about the sun, which is entirely made of plasma, as I said earlier. Um, the the real heat of the sun is in the surrounding corona, which is like a kind of shell or ring uh, way outside of it. The main sun itself has what we call the surface of the sun. The, the technical name is the photosphere. It's not a real surface. You couldn't stand on it if you were immune to the heat uh, because it's all sort of those sort of whirly things that you see, you know, all those uh, turbulent things going on, whatever they are. That's known as the photosphere, and we call it, quote, the surface of the sun, unquote. Well, let's just think about that for a moment. What is the temperature of the surface of the sun? Well, it's, it's only about five and a half thousand degrees. What? The sun? Five and a half thousand degrees on the surface of the sun? You must be joking. I mean, surely that's got all the heat and the light and everything that, uh, that makes us able to live. What do you mean the surface of the sun is only five and a half thousand degrees? But it's true. Well, that's, that's less than three times the size, of the, the, uh, the amount of the, the temperature inside of a, a porcelain kiln or a cement kiln on earth. It's actually um, less than half the temperature of the plasma inside a neon light tube in your office. And it's the surface of the, of the sun. Well, it gets worse because, you know, they've got these uh, sunspots and, um, on the sun, which are sort of like holes. You go down in there, you don't know where it goes, really, but you can see it's, it's a hole. You go down there in that hole. And, and, and 
we have ways of measuring temperatures at a distance. And so it's been discovered by the, uh, the scientists who study the sun that the temperature inside a sunspot as you go down is only 3,900 degrees, even less than the surface. Well, now, wait a minute, there's supposed to be this <clears throat> huge hydrogen bomb going on inside the middle of the sun that's you know, providing all the energy. Well, even if there were by convection to get the heat to come up would take 200,000 years because you know the sun is just so gigantic. Everything's wrong with the conventional theory of the sun. Mm -hmm. It was Arthur Eddington way back when in the 20, about 100 years ago, 1920s, who said he thought there was a um, hydrogen bomb type thing that he didn't call it that because the hydrogen bomb didn't exist yet a fusion reaction going on in the center of the sun that caused all this heat and light. And everybody still believes that, even though it can be easily proved that it's wrong. You can't convince a scientist, a working scientist that, and he won't let go of his theory, even if you prove him wrong. So we have a cold sun, not a hot sun. The closer you get to the sun, the colder it gets. Well, what's that mean? Well, what it means is that the electric universe theory is true, that the sun is linked with energy sources outside of itself, which come in at the poles on these currents, which are known as Birkeland currents. I don't want to get too complicated and start talking about them yet. But all the stars in the universe are linked by these, like these threads, these currents, which go streaming around the place. Now, let's think about the solar system. The solar system is completely filled with plasma. It's just a very thin plasma because there's something called the solar wind. Now, until 1962, all the scientists in the world, except for a tiny handful who were considered heretics and were called crazy, thought that what we then called outer space was completely empty, completely, totally empty, a perfect vacuum. Oh, yes, there was nothing there because there, I would say religious dogma insisted that outer space, in quotes, had to be completely empty, in quotes. It's what's in quotes that counts. Well, Fritz Zwicky, a Swiss astronomer, came up with evidence in the 40s, 1940s, that he, there was, it wasn't empty in, in outer space. He couldn't get his paper published for 10 years. No science journal of any kind would print it. I mean, no astronomical journal, physics journal, astrophysical journal. The director of his own observatory wrote to the editors of them and said, don't you dare publish Fritz's crazy paper. It will discredit the observatory. They all think we're all mad. He thinks that outer space is not empty. For 10 years, he couldn't publish his findings, which were perfectly sound scientific findings. He was censored, he was canceled. We think cancel culture is new, it's not. <clears throat> Why do you think Giordano Bruno was burnt at the stake? He was a victim of cancel culture. So poor old Fritz. Finally, he got an idea. He thought, I'm gonna to go to this guy that I know who's the editor of a biology journal, biology journal, and publish my paper about astronomy. The editor of the biology a journal agreed. He published Fritz's article about astronomy in his biology journal. This meant that Fritz's paper had been published in a peer-reviewed journal and he had off prints, which he could post to all the world's astronomers. He had been reborn. He managed to get into print by circumventing all the obstacles by all the idiots who tried to cancel him. And, and then in 1962, the Americans launched satellites and discovered, my God, outer space is not empty. Uh, duh. That guy, Fritz Zwicky, who we thought was crazy and we've been sneering and scoffing at him for all these years, and we wouldn't talk to him and we wouldn't let him into our meetings and we wouldn't publish his papers because he's completely mad, was right. 
Well, this is just going on the whole time. My book is full of the stories of all the heroes in science who did not believe in herd thinking, who used their own brains. There's a switch here somewhere. All you have to do is turn it on, boom, zing, 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 and your brain works. Most scientists have turned that switch off. They've muted themselves. They won't allow their brains to think because if they do, they won't get a job, they won't get promoted, they won't get grants. So they're a herd and they're a whipped herd and they're a controlled herd and they don't dare go against the herd or they'll be trampled to death and they know it. So they're all slaves. There are a few stalwart characters, heroes of science who have defied all this. And Fritz was one of them. I never knew him, but I did know St. Georgie and I've known many of them. And I tell little anecdotes about a lot of them and uh, in my book. Now, my closest friend of all of them was Peter Mitchell. He was not an astronomer. He was in fact a bioenergeticist who was working out how energy works in the cells in the human body. And he was called insane, mad, he was insulted, humiliated, vilified. He was a wonderful man, but they just couldn't stop insulting poor old Peter until he proved that he was right, that there were these flows of protons through the cells and that energy had a direction in, in the body, in its flows in the cells and through the membranes. And then he got the Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1978. And then all these creeps who'd been insulting him for 20 years. Oh, Peter, good to see you. You know, we knew you were right all along. And so my book is full of the stories of all these guys, many of whom I knew personally, like David Bohm, who was a great friend of mine, um, who, who defied the herd and they suffered for it. But you know, life is all about suffering. That's how you prove your worth. And so you don't always get, um, proven right in your lifetime. Sometimes you died long before they say suddenly, oh God, he was right after all. And these are the people I get on with. I get on with the renegades of science because I'm a difficult person, aren't I? And um, I have done this terrible heretical thing. I've reached back here to the switch and I've gone. And so the whole book is about thinking for yourself knowing the truth, the universe is not made of atoms, it's made of plasma. So what does this now mean? Okay, you're theosophists, that's good, very good. My favorite theosophist, by the way, was GRS Me. Oh, he was just wonderful. Um, I am actually the literary executor of Douglas Fawcett, who lived with Madame Blavatsky towards the end of her life. He was one of the four young men, Mead and, and, and Douglas and, um, and Bert, uh, Bertram Keatley. And John Watkins, Madame Blavatsky said to John Watkins, because I knew his son Jeffrey very, very well. And he told me all this. Uh, now, John, uh, you're not one of the intellectuals of, uh, of our group. So I have uh, assigned you to another job. It's your job and mission to create um, a bookshop that will be an esoteric bookshop. And of course there were none in the world. So he founded John Watkins Bookshop in London in Cecil Court, and it's still there, the world's very first esoteric bookshop. And so that was part of Madame Blavatsky's plan to fight materialism. You had to have a bookshop and she was right. And, and good old Jeffrey, he faithfully kept it going. His son didn't uh, go on with it, and, uh, but it's still there under uh, other ownership. And so, um, you know, I admire all these people. The thing is that you are theosophists and you have to carry the torch and it's up to you folks. It's your job, your mission. <clears throat> Speaking for Madame Blavatsky for a moment, I assign to you the job of going out there and go out to the corners of the world and, and uh, in the new church, take the gospel, the uh, evangelium of plasma and get out there and start propagandizing because it, we're in a war here against materialism and it's your job to be soldiers in that war. And I'm sure you already realize it or you wouldn't be a member of this society. So 
what does it mean for us? Now, this is really important because we are essentially made of plasma ourselves. We are, we are bioplasma entities, all of us. We do not die when our physical bodies wear out and we have to leave them. What is called death here on this planet Earth by everybody is not death. It's all wrong. And the forces of evil, and there's plenty of them about, and we're in a war against them, want everybody to get really depressed. And they want to make them afraid of death and being extinguished. And everybody's afraid of death. And they think, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to die. Oh, we're all going to die. We're going to die. We're all going to die. And, and then they think that's the end. You see, they will be extinct. So here's, here's what I say to people. There's the good news and the bad news. The good news is that nobody dies. Nobody ever dies. But the bad news is that nobody ever dies. Just think about that for a moment. What this means is that you are stuck with yourself for eternity. How would you like to be locked in a room forever with somebody you couldn't stand? You better start learning to love yourselves because you're stuck with yourself forever. And that's what life is about. There are plenty of people in this world who don't like themselves at all, and they secretly want to die. They're looking forward to it because they can't stand being with themselves because they're so horrible. And they know they are because they're wicked and they've done terrible things and, and they're going to do more too because they've decided to. Now, the whole thing is based on being able to redeem yourself. You can change. First thing you do is you go, you turn the switch here. You use your brain. Now, of course, you may be at a disadvantage there because you don't have the manual. I mean, how do you use a brain once you turn it on? Well, <laughs> that's another problem. You have to work on that one out for yourselves, I'm afraid. But um, you find that uh, you can feel your way. Although I'm sure that most of you have got your brains already turned on or you wouldn't be listening to this Zoom and watching this Zoom, I can tell you. So um, if we're bioplasma entities and we don't die and we're only here temporarily, and my name is only temporarily Robert Temple, and when we get born, we have our um, memories wiped. It's like a complete wipe of the hard disk of a computer, you know, everything's gone bang. I mean, suddenly you're born and you're, you know, when you have enough, when, you, when you're wakey wakey enough to sort of think, well, where, you, you're thinking, who, where am I? Who are those people who cook, keep looking down at me with big eyes and going, goo, goo, goo? And you later discover they're called your parents. And then, what is this place? And um, who am I? What am I doing here? Why am I here? Uh, and who are all these people? Uh, bec we, bec because they have total amnesia. And that is essential to live a, a good life on Earth. You have to have the amnesia to start with. And we all come here with good intentions, those of us who have good intentions. And we say, oh boy, this next time I'm going to really, really do it. I'm not going to fail like I did last time. This time, next time, when I get there, you wait and see. I'm, I'm going to be really good and I'm going to do all kind of, kind of good stuff. But of course, most of us fail. And what we have to realize <clears throat> is that all of us fail in most things that we try to do. And do not be discouraged. Failure is part of learning. Do not worry about failing. I can't tell you how many times I failed. I mean, thousands of times I failed. And you have all failed thousands of times. And you will go on failing. From time to time, you succeed. That's really a good feeling. And, um, and if you can succeed even 5% of the time in the, in the good things that you try to do, then you are a success story because 5% is good. I'm afraid that's how tough it is here on Earth because there's all these obstacles. Everybody's trying to stop you. Try and do good things. Just try and do good things. You'll find everybody's against you. No, then there's the bureaucrats and there's the rules 
and, and, and um, people will try and discredit you and you make enemies by trying to be good. Don't try and be good because everybody will hate you. You know all these things. Well, that's why we're here. And we are bioplasma beings who have incarnated here in this tough place called Earth. We've had our memories wiped. Um, I began to get some far memories back only when I was 21. And that's early. Many people don't ever get any back. And of course, um, that's also part of the learning. You have to not know who you are in order to find out who you are. So um, if we live in a plasma world and we are plasma entities and somebody sent a question in, in advance, do I think the sun is conscious? The answer is yes. The sun is an absolutely gigantic plasma entity. It is alive, it is intelligent, it is conscious, and it's got its eye on us. And it's filling the entire um, solar system with this solar wind. And that's why I was talking about the empty space thing earlier, because from 1962, we discovered that the solar system is full of a solar wind and it is an entity. It's filled with plasma. The whole solar system right to the edges is part of the sun. We are in the sun now because the solar wind is an extension of the sun. So we are basically living a secret plasma life under the surface of our atomic life that we're doing here. And um, it's all like a magical mystery tour or, or, or it's a mystery drama that we're enacting as we try to perfect ourselves against all the odds by becoming even a little bit good at once in a while instead of worshiping mammon, money, things, stuff. You know, we want to, want to become rich, want to become powerful. We want fame, 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 what a nuisance. I mean, fame? What a lot of people who don't know anything think about you, they want to see you jiggling around on a stage or something and like Kylie Minogue showing off her bum. I mean, she's a charming girl, but I think, you know, she could have been a little bit more discreet. <clears throat> Do you want to be famous? You shouldn't want to be famous. <clears throat> Do you want to be rich? You shouldn't want to be rich, but you should want to have enough to not be starving, right? <clears throat> now, a new signs of heaven. I do plead with you, please, 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 even if you don't like reading, try and read the book. And there is an audio version of it, which I recorded myself. As you can imagine, it's a bit irreverent. And, um, and so you can listen to that if you're a listener. There's nothing wrong with the listening. And um, a lot of my friends prefer that. And um, you, you do need to go over it more than once because even though it's, it's all clear, everybody tells me they understand it, um, but um, it's just too much to take in. And so you, you need to you know, take it slowly because every page has got new information. So um, the whole point about a plasma universe is that we need a new science, a, a new plasma science. Now we've got part of it because in the past, 15 years or so, it's been intensifying. There are reasons to study plasma to do with um, the attempts to control fusion for the production of energy, which may or may not be possible. It's still not clear. And, um, and so there's a lot of research going on. And um, the, the whole basis of even the formation of matter uh, is, is, is uh, something that's gonna be coming out of this. Now I must tell you that in 1961, two strange phenomena were observed by a Polish astronomer called Kazimierz Kordelewski, that's Kordelewski, um, in our own Earth-Moon system. Two huge clouds at the points known as L4 and L5, Lagrange points, I'll tell you more about them in a moment, um, where the, the gravity balances out between the Earth and the Moon, and they can stay there and not be stressed by gravity. These are gigantic clouds. Together, they are 18 times the size of the Earth. So the Earth-Moon system is not really an Earth-Moon system. 
just trying to absorb that thought. It's a two cloud system with an earth and a moon thrown in. Well, the clouds are 18 times the size of the earth. So it's a two cloud system, not an earth moon system. And of course the moon is tiny as we know. So we've got to get our perspective here. What's this about these clouds? In 2019, they were confirmed by some Hungarian astronomers. I, can, I, knew, I realized they'd done that. I got in touch with them. And I said, now, uh, because I instantly knew what this meant. I said, are you studying the plasma aspects of these clouds? And they, and they replied to me and they said, no, we're only studying the celestial dynamics. Well, I thought, okay, here's my signal. I have to do it. And so I got hold of my friend who's a Sri Lankan called Chandra Vikrama Singha. It, it starts with a W, but they pronounce a W like a V in the same way the Germans and the Poles do. Vikrama Singha. All those Sri Lankan names can be a bit difficult. He was a professor of astrophysics and uh, is a great friend of mine. And he was the main protege of Sir Fred Hoyle, uh, who, whom I also knew. And, um, and we wrote a paper about the, the clouds, which we published in Advances in Astrophysics, just to bring the plasma aspects to attention. And, and it's all in throughout my book about these clouds. What the plasma scientists on Earth have discovered, and, and the Russian scientists were the most advanced in this, especially, um, well, I won't start throwing Russian names at you. It's all in the book. But the, um, the most advanced plasma physicists have discovered that uh, um, large, dusty, complex plasma clouds they have to have dust in them, and they make their own dust, as was discovered in, only in 1989, um, can develop intelligence. In other words, a huge cloud can become a huge brain. All the details are in the book. I don't want to start talking to you about brain formation in plasma clouds, but believe me, it has been proved in the laboratory that these things can happen. Now, we're talking about these huge clouds developing gigantic computing power. Well, they're so huge, and we're just talking about the two that are near us, the Kordolevsky clouds, I mean, the sun, is immensely larger than that. It's a gigantic brain. Well, the sun and these clouds, they know all about us. You see, in America, the security agencies, they've got these huge computer complexes, I think in Utah or under a mountain or something. Um, and they, what they do is they monitor every phone call and every email and every text message you know, it's like having uh, um, a gigantic bucket the size of the earth full of shopping lists. Of course, they can't listen to or read all this stuff. I don't know how they sort it out. That's their business. But that means nothing compared to what's stored in the clouds. The entire history of the human species and all the animal species and all the plant species of the entire history of the earth <clears throat> is stored in the clouds. They know everything. They know what I'm saying right now. And they, they, they know who you are. They know all the things that all the spy agencies wish they could know. But the clouds already know it. <clears throat> now, are the clouds friendly? That'll be the first paranoid fear. Are the clouds friendly? Maybe we should start nuking them. Bad idea. If the clouds weren't friendly, you can be absolutely sure of one thing, we wouldn't still be here. So the assumption is that they want us to be here. Well, why would they want us to be here? Well, the idea is that they're nurturing us. I think that's the only sensible way to look at it. And, and I maintain that they tried unsuccessfully to communicate with us. Um, that section of my book was taken out by the publisher. I must publish that at some point. There is a historically recorded series of events, which I believe were attempts by those clouds to communicate, communicate with human civilization, which failed miserably. 
But, um, and it was proved conclusively by a friend of mine who's now died <clears throat> that those attempts were coming from the cloud at L5, the Lagrange point. Uh, <clears throat> I should just say these two points in space are called Lagrange points. They're named after a famous scientist called Lagrange. Well, his real name was Lagrangia. He was an Italian, but most people call him Lagrange because they speak of him as if he were French, thinking he was French, but he was really Italian. And we say in English, Lagrange, because we mispronounce everything, as you know. And um, that's okay. And we abbreviate it by just saying L for Lagrange. So there's L4 and there's L5. And these are the two points between the Earth and the Moon, 60 degree angles either way, not in direct line of sight, um, where the gravitational pull of the Earth and the gravitational pull of the Moon balance out to zero. And you can just sit there and not get stressed. And you can become a cloud and, and not get pulled apart by gravity. It just won't bother you. And so that's where these two clouds are. Now, I spoke to my friend Uri Geller about this on the phone because he's in Israel and one doesn't really go to Israel very often. And um, I said, what do you think, Uri, uh, about the clouds? Because I really wanted to know what Uri thought about the clouds. And he said, instantly, he said, no, no, Robert, I don't think that they came into being there spontaneously. I think they were put there by a highly advanced extraterrestrial alien civilization long ago, because they're billions of years old. And so he thinks that they were put there by this very advanced alien civilization. That's Uri's take on it. And uh, who knows? Um, but it doesn't matter really, except in the ultimate sense. The fact is that they may have come together spontaneously over the eons because they're um, um, probably older than the Earth, uh, or um, or they were put there or constructed. I mean, who knows? But they're there. That's the main thing. They're 18 times the size of the Earth, each one nine times the size of the Earth, and they're over there and they're over there, 60 degree angles, and uh, um, and so we're faced with a situation where we've got a two cloud system in, into which we are basically interlopers and intruders because we live on this tiny planet that's 18 times smaller than they are. And it has a moon that's even smaller than that. And, um, and, and as for uh, ourselves, we're, we're, we're not even little uh, tiny uh, ants, you know? But it doesn't mean we're unimportant. The key to being an ant in a in a universe is it not to be fooled to think that that means that you're insignificant. All it means that your size is insignificant. That's not the same as you being insignificant. You see, that's the difference. This is a point which many metaphysicians have overlooked. And People got depressed when Copernicus said the Earth's going around the sun and because it meant that the Earth was no longer the center of the whole universe. And they thought, oh, this is bad because it means we mean, we're, we're nothing now. We don't mean anything anymore. We're not the center of everything anymore. But that's nonsense. And um, to know that you're not the center of the universe is, is growing up. It's like infantile omnipotence is what psychologists call the state of mind of a baby. It cries and mummy comes in and feeds it. So it believes it's all powerful. It is the center of the universe, but it eventually learns sooner rather than later that it's not. And that, and that when it gets a bit older, mummy, what doesn't come in and feed you every time you cry? And you can have a tantrum if you like, and it doesn't mean you're gonna get your way. So earth is in this process of overcoming its infantile omnipotence but it's insufficiently accomplished because the scientists still believe that atoms are central to the universe and they're not. How do you get this bone away from that dog? So it's up to us folks, um, theosophists on the march, please. Um, um, I've recently been reading a, a, a book which I discovered was written by the, the, uh, the vicar who wrote the words to the hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers, which was quite a shock to realize. And um, it was a very scholarly work about the history of the, um, the hostile um, and lost gospels and so on. A subject of great interest to our good friend, uh, Mead. He was a real expert on that. 
he came after this chap whose name was Baring Gould. And, um, and so I would say onward Christian soldiers, which I always thought was a bit too martial for peace loving Christians who are supposed to turn the other cheek and so forth, is interesting because maybe onward theosophists, because there is a battle going on between ignorance and truth, otherwise known as good and evil. And we can't shirk in this fight. And so do you think it was easy for me to read all that stuff and learn all that stuff to write this book? I, was, I didn't get a degree in science. I started out as a Sanskrit scholar. I got a degree in Sanskrit. I was supposed to be an orientalist. I have taught myself all this, and so can you, if you turn the switch. And I know it's difficult. It's very difficult to get all this complicated stuff and try and write it down so that people can understand it, even if, even if it's a bit overwhelming. Don't worry. But we have to get the message across that we don't die, that, that we are eternal, that we do have to learn to become good, because if we don't, we're not getting anywhere. Because it's only character that counts. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Fame is nothing. Possessions are nothing. Um, the fact is that it's your character. It's your character that we're here to improve. And that's what life's all about. And understanding about the plasma universe and that we are bioplasma beings and that we don't die and that we, we don't get anywhere until we become good, that's the message. So you see, this is where the, the scientific discoveries by this, these tiny colonies of minority scientists around the world that nobody understands, the plasma physicists, it's, it's giving us the, the intellectual and scientific backing to create this new paradigm. I call upon you all to join in that paradigm. And please ask me as many as embarrassing questions as you can possibly think of when it comes to question time.